Hello everybody, Saul Ochoa here. Uh, I'm a cut man born in Los Angeles, born and raised in Southern California. Uh, good morning to everybody. The way I got started as, as a cut man was actually, it's, it's a funny story, I like telling it. Um, I work in the medical field and I've worked at an office in Garden Grove where it's called Renewed Strength Medical Group. And I've worked there for about 15 years now. And one day me and one of my coworkers were talking about what we used to say we wanted to be when we were growing up, you know, as kids. And I told her that I used to thought I wanted to be a boxer, you know, that was what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, why don't you find a, another way to still be involved in the sport? And she suggested that I manage fighters. But I don't know the first thing about managing, you know, I'll, I'll ruin someone's career if I get into managing. <laughs> and then she said, what about coaching? Become a trainer. Same thing. I don't know the first thing. But immediately a little light bulb went off, you know, that I thought, well, wait, I'm, I'm in the medical field already. I do wound care. Why don't I try and become a cut man? And that was kind of it. You know, that was the moment where I was like, I, I think I'm going to do that. The very next day I applied for a credit card, got approved, and as soon as I got it in the mail, I bought a bunch of stuff that I would need. Videos, you know, a bunch of equipment, watch videos on YouTube, DVDs on how to wrap hands, that sort of thing. And that was it. That was 12 years ago now. Wow, yeah. Years. yeah. And so how, what are like some of the key points of being a cut man? Being a cut man, really anybody could do it. I'm more or less self-taught. Like I said, I watched videos, but I never really got to apprentice under anybody. You know, I, I did at shows, I would run into legendary cut men like Joe Chavez and uh, Miguel Diaz. You know, I'd run into them and I'd pick their brain when I could, but I never really got to apprentice under anybody. Wrapping hands, I would practice on my friends. You know, I never would get together. My friends and my brothers, I'd practice on them. And that's how I learned uh, how to do that but the one thing you cannot be to be a cut man is squeamish when it comes to blood anybody that's you know there's a lot of people that are afraid of blood and that's one thing you cannot be to be a cut man yeah yeah sure. um yeah it could get real pretty bloody absolutely yeah. and you also do mma right i've done i haven't done mma in a long time but yes i was doing mma for a while yeah. and yeah. how much bloodier is that because I went to my For first sure. MMA fight like maybe I don't know two three years ago oh, really? and I was like shocked I yeah. was like wow so much blood it can get very bloody it can get very bloody mm -hmm. and in MMA the crazy thing about that is that a cut for as bad as it could be that's not going to necessarily stop the fight you know so they'll let it continue so in MMA you have to be able to to really work a cut mm -hmm. to to make it there to make it an MMA and how do you work a cut in both MMA and boxing? pressure cold compress pressure if it's big enough we use the medicine you know cotton swabs and you put as much pressure on there as you can during those uh, mm -hmm. those precious seconds that you get in between rounds and uh, apply some salve on there and send the fighter out for the next round awesome. pressure is key though mm -hmm. pressure is key and uh, what are the key components of uh, safety with the hands and the wrapping? Gloves. I see a lot of guys still that don't use gloves. Oh, you're talking about hand wraps? Yeah, or hand Okay. Wraps. The hand wraps, really you have to know the anatomy of the hand, you know, the carpal bones here and mm -hmm. how they could break. There actually is a specific fracture that doctors call a boxer's fracture, you know? So that, that happens a lot. A lot of fighters have hurt their hands like that. Um, Floyd Mayweather has hurt his hands like that or the late Arturo Gotti hurt his hands like that mm -hmm. so you really have to know how to wrap hands to make sure the fighter does not hurt his hands it's how he makes his money yeah. you know they, the fighters have to know that they can trust you so snug tight and lots of padding up on the knuckles wow. yeah. Amazing. Um, and what is it exactly the where is the fracture in the hand it's right at the ulna and the radius, right in okay. here. And either one of those can break. Jeez. And yeah. is that because of their power or the, just uh, the A hard hit, an uh, angle, it's the impact for sure. If it doesn't hit flush, mm -hmm. say if like if this was a fighter's head and the mm -hmm. punch catches like the bottom fingers mm -hmm. and there's a twist like this, there goes the fracture, you know? Mm -hmm. it, has to, it has to really land flush and follow mm -hmm. through completely flat. If there's a twist in there anywhere, mm -hmm 
that's where it's gonna happen. Arturo Gotti, the way he broke his hand is he hit uh, Mickey Ward on the hip, mm -hmm. right in here, and the impact is what did it. Jeez. Yeah. And what is the recovery process? That depends. Fighters are fighters are usually you know in great shape, great athletes. So the recovery process isn't too long. Four to six weeks, probably in a cast. Rehab a, a little bit after that, and maybe by the eighth or tenth week, the, they're ready to start mm -hmm. light training again. Oh, okay. yeah. Light and then continue. To continue, yeah, progress on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> progress to sparring. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your fighters. Who have you uh, worked with? And I've worked with several different fighters. I consider myself lucky because I love doing it. Uh, yeah, right off the bat, I want to say hi out there to Mike Sanchez, uh, Chuy Beltran, David Angeles. Um, got so many guys. I Isaiah Varnell, um, uh, Danny Danny Flores, Alvinado Flores. Uh, a lot of guys that I've gotten the chance to work with. Uh, Manuel Mendez. Um, God, so, and, and you know when you have to think about it is when you you can remember the, the yeah. least but uh, a lot of guys that I've gotten to work with so many different shows um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity for sure how um, what shows have you gone to that like really made an impact on you you know what 2019 was the best year of my cut man career that I've had to date I worked um, Pretty much all the 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 uh, big venues here in, in Southern California for all the big promoters. I've worked uh, uh, StubHub Center, Dignity Health Sports Park. That's now it's good. what it's called. Uh, Staples Center, um, Fantasy Springs Casino, Chumash Casino, um, and I've worked events for the Golden Boy Banner, Top Rank, Match Room. I mean, a, a lot of different events. It's just, it's good to experience a lot of different things, you know, PBC as well, Rabo Bank Arena, I've worked events out there, um, because you learn how different promoters handle their events, you know, how things run, and that's always good to know, you know, you meet different people, it's good to network with, with uh, other people, other colleagues, and um, every, every event that I'm at, I just try and you know, be open and observe and take in as much as you can. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, who, who in the, in like a, as a fighter, um, who did you grow up watching? I grew up watching, um, when I was a kid, we lived in Compton and mm -hmm. it was when Julio Cesar Chavez was in his prime. You know, when it was mm -hmm. like fights in the late 80s, early 90s. So fights from like 70, from like his 70th, Pro fight, maybe even sooner, to when he took his his first loss. I was watching Julio Cesar Chavez, and then all the guys on those undercards. You know, um, uh, Terry Norris. I'd fight. I'd, I'd watch all those guys. Uh, there was a there's a gentleman that lived around the corner from where we lived in Compton, and in that neighborhood, he was the only one that had cable. So all the all the old men, you know, they they all knew each other. The, the older men. And uh, they were all buddies, and he was the one because he had cable. Fight night was at his house, you know. Everybody would come over. Some people would bring their kids. My dad would bring me along, and that's where I got into it. That's really where I got into it. Yeah, watching, have, watching all those guys. Do you have a uh, pound for pound now? Now, if mm -hmm. if you want to know who I think is a pound for pound number one, I would say Saul Alvarez, Canelo mm -hmm. Alvarez. I think mm -hmm. that guy is the, the number one fighter right now. There's definitely mm -hmm. arguments, you know, for other fighters. Terrence Crawford, Errol mm -hmm. Spence, you know, all those guys. Um, Lomachenko, Tofimo Lopez, those guys are going to fight soon. We'll see who's the better of them. Who do you think? You know what? Uh, I think I think it's going to be a great fight. Mm -hmm. It might go into the deep rounds. I don't think it's going to end. In a decision so i think someone's getting knocked out but we'll see who it's gonna be we'll see who it's gonna be well, Loma, i like lomachenko's angles you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, i think uh, out of everybody who's fought him they all say that it's 
the the mental state he puts you in. Yeah. Yeah. It confuses you. Yeah. You don't know where that guy is gonna punch you from. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So that's I think that's his advantage. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. Um. Let's see what else. Um. Okay. So tell me, how does one uh, really get involved uh, in being a cut man? The way to really get involved in being a cut man, if you really want to get into it, go to a gym. Go to a gym and talk to the gym owner or whoever runs the the gym, and you can talk to them about who their cut man is. And a lot of times, a lot of guys are very open to teaching someone. You know, there, there are some guys out there that uh, probably won't want to do it. They won't want to give away their little secrets that they have. But for the most part, everyone is pretty open to, to teaching the next guy, you know. And um, practice. Like I said, I, I practice hand wraps on my buddies and, and on my brother. That's really the, the best teacher is, is practicing. But um, it, it definitely helps if you have someone that you can go to and ask questions, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, how has boxing affected your, your life? Boxing, I would say, is my number one sport. I've, I've been a fan of it, like I said, since I was a time. All right, so um, tell me a little bit about your experience with MMA as you were training. Right, as training, my yeah, training. Uh, the MMA training I did was at um, International Martial Arts Studio in Bueno Park under Master Mike Lee. Um, mm -hmm. Great school over there. They moved. They're no longer where they used to be, but the school's still open. He's still training. Uh, he's still training people, and it's a great school. I loved it there. I was there for I think I went maybe six or seven years. So I met a lot of different people there. He had fighters at the school as well. Uh, so I there I worked with uh, Giovanni Torres, uh, Ken Glover, uh, Fernando Gonzalez, uh, a, a few different guys that he had there. He had a, a female fighters there too. Jesse Nasrallah uh, was there. Um, uh, Shaquita Woods was there. You know, funny thing, Shaquita Woods in her amateur debut tied the uh, the camel record for fastest knockout in, in the state. It was seven seconds, so that was that was pretty great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was her cut man for that fight, so that 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 was pretty that was pretty special. But I loved it there. You know, I did um, I did kickboxing there in Muay Thai, uh, a little bit of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It, it was a great school, mm -hmm. definitely good times. So, uh, do you get excited like a fan when you see your fighters win? Absolutely. Or do you try like, to no, <laughs> no, you can't help it. You definitely get excited. Yeah. You know, you're being in the corner. I always tell people that I have the second best seat in the house, and they their question naturally is, "Well, what's the first? Well, the referee. You know, the referee has the best seat in the house. He's in there with them. So the second best is a cornerman. You know, we get to go in the ring or in the cage as well with the fighters and and work directly with them. So that's that's uh, that's pretty special to me to be able to do that. Um, but it's yeah, definitely you, you can't hold back the emotion. You know, when when your fighter gets the gets the win. Just like you also you know sometimes it's hard to hide the emotion when your fighter loses. You know, fighter gets knocked down. Nobody wants that. So it's you know a little bit of both mm -hmm. yeah do you like uh, boxing more than mma or vice versa no i'm, about the same? I'm definitely a bigger fan of boxing than mma but mm -hmm. but I, I love mma mm -hmm. just just as well and which one of the two do you think is most dangerous you know god it's funny because in mma like you can get your limbs broken you know you can get put to sleep and mm -hmm. and and break all kinds of bones uh, but not a lot of fighters have died as a result of you know injuries in the cage but in boxing we've had so many fighters you know pass away because of their injuries in the ring and mm -hmm. or fighters that um, you know end up needing long-term health care or 24-hour help or on the clock like Pritchard Colon you know mm -hmm. um, his his story that that's truly sad what, what ended up happening to him but I mean, boxing, I guess it's because it's just sustained 
blows to the head for 12 rounds, 45 minutes of, of getting hit to the head. I, you gotta say that that's the most dangerous, you know? It's, the, the evidence is there, you know, deaths and, and injuries. It's, it's there, the, the evidence shows that boxing is definitely more dangerous. Do fights need to get stopped sooner? We don't know. You know, we don't, we don't know what is going on. That's why fights got shortened from 15 to 12 rounds, you know, in the 80s after Ray Mancini mm -hmm. had his fight with Duke Kim in Vegas and mm -hmm. Duke Kim died as a result of that fight. So the w, I think it was the WBC that shortened, was the, was the first to shorten fights from 12 to 15 rounds and then everybody else followed. But um, I don't know what else needs to happen to make it a little bit safer. Maybe is it going to be trainers, you know, that have to take on the responsibility of stopping their guy saving from himself, him. you know, saving him from himself? I don't know. Yeah, I, and it, it is, it can be a little bit difficult for the fighter, right? Yeah. Because um, I've seen so many fights where a fighter is losing and he knows he's losing. But he doesn't want to give up. Doesn't want to quit. And and I see that they're, you know, I mean, a lot of them are young and they're just like, no, like, no, like, send me back there. Yeah. You know, and like, what do you say? Those are the guys that have to be, you know, you got to mm -hmm. save them from themselves. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. total heart, you know, 100% mm -hmm. brave uh, warriors, no quit in them. But you, as the trainer, you have to know when to say, you know what, no. There's no point. We're behind on the scorecards. Mm -hmm. We're probably not going to get a knockout to win this. Let's just stop this now. Mm -hmm. You know? And um, what would you tell the young fighters that are tr in training now or, or they one day want to be a world champion? Um, or maybe they even haven't even tried um, a, a, a combat sport yet? Stay in school. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's most the more important thing, right? Yeah, stay, in yeah, stay in school and maybe school, don't yeah. become a fighter. But mm -hmm. if that's something that that you do mm -hmm. want to do as a as a young kid, you want to be a fighter. Definitely, you have to take it serious. There's no, you know, the, as the saying goes, you don't play boxing. Mm -hmm. The boxing is the only sport where you cannot play. You you can't play boxing. You have to take it serious. It has to be. Mm -hmm. uh, 90% of your life when you're training, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, and the, that's every day. That's every single day, yeah. you know, there, there shouldn't be any days off. Mm -hmm. The name of the game is hit and don't get hit. Mm -hmm. I mean, brawls and wars are fun for the fans, mm -hmm. you know, and even the fighters, if they, if they come out of it all right, you know, they come out mm -hmm. thinking, man, that was a hell of a fight. You know, that was a, a great performance. Mm -hmm. I love that. But it's not the best way to, to, fight your fights mm -hmm. you know going to war like that it's it's not the smartest thing to do but a lot of guys do it it's kind of their style like i said it's fan friendly promoters love it for sure yeah. but mm -hmm. um it's hit and don't get hit you know mm -hmm. floyd mayweather arguably one of the best boxers you know mm -hmm. the best boxer in all of boxing you can literally count the fights with the fingers on one hand how many times that guy actually found himself you know in, in like a real fight mm -hmm. but that that's that's it that's that's hit and don't get hit um, Is there something that you say or what would be the best thing to say at that point? As a, as a cut man, it's not really my mm -hmm. deal to provide instructions or anything like that. But when, mm -hmm. when we don't get the W, you do have to let the fighter know, hey, you know what? You, you went out there and you did your best. Mm -hmm. You know, we just got to train harder next time mm -hmm. and prepare. Be, be more ready for the next one than we thought we were for this one. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it, you know, mm -hmm. let them 
just give them words of encouragement. Because mm -hmm. after a loss, everyone is, you know, all, all, all fighters are feeling a little down, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, the good thing is that they come out of the fight healthy and are able to go home to their families. That's the important thing. Yeah. Get ready for the next mm -hmm. one. And how about those fighters who don't get their win and um, they, they, have, they find themselves having trouble to come back? What do you say to them? It's, you know, it depends on that, I guess, depends on where each fighter's career is at the at the time of the loss, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyone, I guess, if, if you're already thinking about maybe this isn't for me, you know, I, especially maybe someone that hasn't gotten a win in a couple fights, you know? If they're already thinking about maybe moving on, maybe it is time to move on, you know, and, and think about doing something else. But if if their mm -hmm. if their heart is still in it and their mind is still in it and they're hungry for a win, you'll you'll find out if they want to go back in the gym or not. Mm -hmm. You'll see them back in the gym. Sometimes as soon as a week right after the loss, they'll be back in the gym. Mm -hmm. And those are the guys that that at some point either their career is going to turn around, or if maybe they take the one more loss where they thought, you know, man, I was ready for this fight. I should have won this fight. Maybe I'm just not that good. And they'll move on to something else. Mm -hmm. But um, the, like I said, the important thing is if you can still go home to your family mm -hmm. and you're safe and you're healthy, that's that's the most important thing at the end of the fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that's one of the things that in reality you kind of have to think about, right, yeah. as a fighter. Absolutely. Um, you have to think of your own safety and the safety of your opponent too Correct. because um, I met someone uh, many years ago and um, I won't name him who he is but um, he was um, in, a, in a competition I forgot if it was amateur or pro but um, he says that you know the, uh, his opponent passed away because of you know their fights yeah. right and so um, dealing with that To get past that, yeah. I can believe it. Yeah. That's definitely impactful. Mm -hmm. um, Gabriel Relas, you know, had someone, uh, one of his opponents, Jimmy Garcia, die. You know, he died days later after the fight, but it, it was definitely because of the fight. And I think after that fight, you can really go back and see Rafael's fights after that, and he was he was never really the same guy. You know, he was never really the same fighter. So that, that definitely takes a lot out of guys. You know, I've also seen fights where, and this was in an MMA fight, uh, these, these two fighters, they, they were going at it, and clearly one of them was the, be was the better fighter, superior skills. And he was beating up his opponent so bad, and the referee wasn't stopping the fight, you know, that the guy that was winning actually took a knee and tapped out. He quit. He, he, he quit, didn't want to, he took the loss because he didn't want to hurt his opponent anymore. And that's huge, you know, for somebody to do that and, and recognize what's going on. And, you know, maybe he thought, man, if I continue pounding this guy, he may not go home in his car. He might be catching a ride in an ambulance. He didn't want that on his conscience, on his mind. So he took a knee and tapped out. He took the loss to... to help the other guy out get out of the fight yeah, and i think um you know that's what you know martial arts kind of teaches right like yeah just the discipline and the you know the thoughtfulness of it and exactly. you know i think you know a lot of people a lot of fighters they do it for show and for you know their promotions you know they're like oh i'm gonna kill this guy yeah you know but at the same time you know i think we have to think about those realities so it actually yeah, can happen it can and you know what i don't think anyone ever means that mm -hmm. you know a lot of guys say yeah, that you know show, i'm hurt him i'm hurt him bad but mm -hmm. i don't know that anyone really means that Unless there really, truly is bad blood between the 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 two mm -hmm. the two combatants, because why would you really want to hurt someone? You know, to to the point where there's you know bodily harm and potential long term effects. I, I wouldn't want to do that. You know, if I were if I were fighting, I would not need that on you know in the back of my mind every time you're in there. Uh, so I, I I think a lot of fighters say that. 
I don't think anyone really needs it, you know, unless, like I said, if, if the guys really hate each other, mm -hmm. then maybe that's the case, but I would say that's very few. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay, um, uh, what do you say that are probably the top three lessons in boxing, uh, le life lessons, that is? The top three life lessons in boxing? Mm -hmm. discipline one of them for sure mm -hmm. um, you know that that's probably the biggest one too is discipline because if you can apply the, the training and the lessons that you learn in boxing if you can apply those to your everyday life mm -hmm. uh, I'd say you're gonna be okay because trainers a lot of trainers also take on the role of father figures for their for their fighters and it's, um, you know, maybe it's not necessarily that the fighter doesn't have his dad around, but he, you know, the trainers tend to sometimes get involved even emotionally in, in the fighter's life. And that's okay, you know, nothing wrong with that. That's definitely okay. But if, if you can take the discipline you learn in the gym and apply that to, to your everyday life, you know, whether it's with your family, your kids, your, your wife, uh, I think I think you're gonna be okay. Discipline is key to everything. Yeah, no, I agree. I feel like a lot of the youth um, kind of rely on on fighting. You know, yeah. I was uh, talking to someone um, about a, a youth program that they uh, were part a part of, and a lot of the youth would go there to eat after after uh, school, and that was probably. A good thing because at home maybe they were you know raised by a single parent or uh or grandparents yeah and i think that was a trend for a while yeah right so um so having somewhere to go and having somebody to rely on and, and kind of telling telling you hey you're, you're messing up right now yeah you know i think we all need that accountability absolutely right? so, absolutely but it's definitely that's that whatever program it is you're talking about that's definitely a, a great thing what's going on over there yeah i mean uh, unfortunately i think it just closed oh. but i think pandemic era is very it's hurting uh, everything it's, right it's everything <laughs> everyone and everything yeah and the, it, the pandemic is not discriminating yeah and you know what since the pandemic i actually haven't had a, i haven't worked a fight since the pandemic started I've had the opportunity um, to work over at Top Rank at the Bubble at the MGM Grand, but there was an issue there with some paperwork, a clerical error, and I had to leave. They, they actually, uh, they, they didn't even let me stay in the hotel, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I was there for that. I got to experience a little bit of what's mm -hmm. going on at the Bubble there with Top Rank. Mm -hmm. And How uh, is it? you know what, it's, I think those guys were, mm -hmm more or less setting the standard for how to handle boxing mm -hmm. you know post pandemic mm -hmm. because everything was very controlled and it wasn't like they were on you you know a hundred percent it was just very very controlled the um mm -hmm. top rank has the entire 12th floor of the mgm grand for themselves so fighters trainers uh judges anybody that that's going to be involved has to be there mm -hmm. they COVID test you when you get in they COVID test you again after weigh-ins and then after the fight's over you're free to check out that same night or I think the next morning so but everything is you and know, there's they, no in and out there's no in and out once you're in there you're kind of there they transport you from the hotel over to the conference center um, they provide you with the place to eat so they you know they tell you this is where the cafeteria is they have lunch uh, breakfast lunch and dinner there they have their own gym facilities there red corner has one blue corner has another one and everything gets cleaned after after everyone uses it you know it all gets sanitized and like i said i think those guys are setting setting the bar setting the standard for how it's got it it's got to be done yeah, yeah someone has to yeah. right yeah. and they were having shows so frequently there it was twice a week i think for six or eight weeks they were having shows there twice a week so that they had to you know it was i guess maybe a learning process you know for everybody doing it but everybody was doing a great job yeah. wow that's amazing 
Uh, well, thank you for your time. Uh, do you, you have any last words for us? Um, last words? I just maybe if I can send some shout outs over there. Uh, shout out to Colton Boxing over there, Freddy Barrera, everybody there at the gym. Uh, Califas Boxing up north, Renato Garcia, my buddy Rick, um, Mike Rodriguez, uh, Marky Nieves, John Michael, Sergio Estrada. Uh, these are all guys that have helped me out, you know, along the way in this cut map thing. Mm -hmm. And my wife, Ladine, and my kids, Israel and Mateo. Hey, big guys. That's awesome. And where can we follow you? You can follow me on Instagram. It's just cutman underscore s dot o. And um, on there, you can, anybody that needs any kind of help can just shoot me a DM and we'll go mm -hmm. from there. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you, Yolanda, for having me. All right.